Hello, football fans, and welcome to this special NFL draft episode of the Big D Podcast. Before I announce today's special and anticipated guest, please subscribe, like, comment to the Spunky Spectrum Sports YouTube page where we've got all kinds of NFL draft coverage along the way. I've got a special guest on the line Monday. If you're in Southwest Florida, you may have heard of him, but uh, I'll leave it to be. And uh, one interested person who will be watching the draft next Thursday night in Cleveland is Miami Dolphins fanatic and my buddy Alex. Alex, uh, I can't believe it's I can't believe it's draft week. Uh, this fe- this feels like a normal draft. Well, sort of a normal draft, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's draft week. You're right. We got a week to go to the day. Uh, so we uh, get that nice little trip to Cleveland. It definitely does feel like uh, a normal draft. You know, the lock at, at the number one spot happens every once in a while. We've got another one this year, uh, I'm sure, as you uh, are very well aware of. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, I mean, a lot of playmakers this year. I mean, it seems like this is one of the uh, a really talent-heavy drafts. So uh, it's definitely – I would say I would say a, a normal a normal one, uh, but definitely not quite as exciting as it was for Dolphins fans last year. But uh, still exciting all the same, that's for sure. And speaking of last year, I think it was this. I think it was either it was either yesterday, today, or tomorrow. This time last year, where the Dolphins, uh, rich, well, at the number five spot, and there were all kinds of questions about well, what the Dolphins would do. And uh, they drafted some guy out of Alabama named Two. And uh, I remember, I remember you and your father's reaction, like the Dolphins had won the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean that's that's the goal with uh, in that situation. But yeah, I believe it was yesterday, maybe even possibly the day before. I know, I know we've passed, I know we passed the one year. I think it was yesterday, but I can't be a hundred percent sure on that. But yeah, I mean. That's definitely as close to a Super Bowl feeling as I've felt as a Dolphins fan, the same with my dad, uh, for a very long time. Uh, Hopefully, it it felt like a Super Bowl. Hopefully, it leads to a Super Bowl. But, you know, Jerry's still out on that one. I mean, be honest. Be honest. Looking back on it a year ago, I mean, were you thinking the Dolphins were going to take Tua or thinking they may take Justin Herbert or go somewhere else? I I was – Pretty confident too. It was going to be the guy. I was a little bit more worried about po- the possibility of the team trading up ahead of us, whether that's the Chargers or uh, who we all know was very interested in the quarterback position as well. Um, but I was pretty, I was pretty confident that Tua was the guy. Um, you know, Chris Greer had been seen at, at Tuscaloosa. Had been, had been, he'd been seen at uh, all, pretty much any chance to see Tua uh, in person. He took that opportunity. So I was pretty confident that Tua was the guy. It's just, you know, being a Dolphins fan, especially over the last decade, our drafts have uh, not quite gone to uh, the fans' idea of, of success and uh, eventually no success at all with a lot of those draft classes. But um, with this, with Chris Greer and Brian Flores in charge, I was confident that the uh, right decision was going to be made. And I'm, I'm pretty confident to say that it was made. Don't tell Dolphin fans about Dion Jordan, but that's another day. Yeah. You know, I'm glad we got out of that third pick, just just so we don't have to uh, have flashbacks of uh, calling Dion George's name from that same spot. <laughs> it's like the number three pick. You never want to get it. I mean, no. maybe maybe, was, maybe maybe the Panthers will have better luck for Sam Donham. Yeah, you know, also, I guess uh, good luck with them on that one. But I mean, I mean, thinking thinking about two laughs. I mean. Yeah, he showed moments. I mean, obviously the Arizona game, but looking back on it, do you do you were you did Tua exceed expectations for you? Were you hoping for a little more? Do you think uh, that's what a rookie should have been? Yeah, it's uh, definitely. I wouldn't say exceeded expectations. You know, obviously that Arizona game, like you said. I mean that that's the game that that Dolphins fans are excited about. That that. What, what he did in that game is, is where we, uh, as Dolphins fans, are, have expectations and then uh, more so on, onward. But um, as far as 
how he performed, you know, I think most Dolphins fans will tell you it wasn't, I would say maybe about expectations is about fair enough. I mean, when you really look at the big picture, the whole picture, I mean, the man could have had a career ending injury at that, uh, and that during his junior year at Alabama, obviously he uh, it wasn't it wasn't career ending. He was able to rehab. He was able to recover. He blew past doctors' expectations on his recovery. But you know, anytime you have to, ask, especially as a quarterback, and especially as a quarterback who's got a mobile aspect to their game, to recover from a gruesome hip injury like that. Plus, obviously, as we all know, the COVID um, bug hit the uh, NFL season as long as, as well as the rest of the world. So there was no, it, there was nothing normal about the last off season. There was no normal uh, getting together with his receivers, no normal uh, preseason camps, no normal training camps. So for, you know, for a quarterback coming off an injury like that with no, with limited to no uh, team bonding and preparation before the season, who went six and three. I know it's a team, it's a team, game and uh we know uh wins aren't necessarily a quarterback stat but you know it's expectations are about right on for me and uh you know especially with a full off season a couple more weapons it's definitely the expectations are definitely a lot higher this season yeah and so coming into this and coming into next week's nfl draft the dolphins originally stalled with the number three pick but you traded back with San Francisco and then traded up with Philly. So now you're at number six. So realistically right now, is there one particular player you all absolutely iron at number, you all absolutely hoping the Dolphins get in Cleveland? I don't think there's one particular player. And I think that's where the, uh, where Chris Greer's head point was with that trade is when you're at three, Obviously, the first two picks are going to be quarterbacks. Obviously, Miami's not taking a quarterback, so you pretty much have the best of the rest. With them thinking of going out of three, not only going back to 12, but moving back up to six, all that tells me is if they were thinking linemen, if they were thinking Rashawn Slater or Penai Sewell, they would have stuck at three because they would have taken the best one of the two, and they know for a fact it would have been there. But moving back down to six – just tells me that Chris Greer has two or three names in his mind that he is targeting at that six spot. Cause he doesn't move back if it's not for a pass catcher. Um, Cause if he's going lineman, you never know what Cincinnati's going to do. You never know. So he, he uh, I, I think he's got two names, which are the same names that are, I think in every Dolphins fan's mind with a third, yeah. with a third uh, possibility. If they, if, I'll, I'll just – I'll stop being ambiguous. ambiguous. Uh, it's Obviously, it's it's Kyle Pitts or Jamar Chase. I mean, those are the two guys at the top of the Dolphins draft board. If if I'm wrong on that, then I will be shocked. Um, you know, depending on as, – as you were – as we have talked about a, a little bit uh, off cam, you know, picks four – three and four are really going to kind of determine the uh, – especially the top 10, uh, but the entire first round. But, you know, Kyle Pitts and, and Jamar Chase are definitely the two guys that I'm sure of that Chris Greer is uh, targeting with that six pick. Yeah, and so, I mean, if you look at it from a Dolphin standpoint, the dream setting would be one of, if not both of them, there because basically if Pitts and Chase are there, that means all the quarterbacks are gone and one of the two linemen has gone. Yeah. You know, obviously, um, obviously it's Trevor Lawrence at one. Obviously, it's uh, we're saying just wait, Justin wait, 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 slow uh, down, wait slow that. down, uh, sick, and slow down. Let's see, okay. let's talk about a mock draft scenario right now. That's right. right. Let's talk about a mock draft scenario for okay. the first five or six picks. Okay. Obviously, we know what's happening in one. The Jaguars are going to take Trevor Lawrence. I mean, that's been set in stone for three and a half months. Yep. Uh, the Jets are going to take Zach Wilson at two. Yep. Uh, San Francisco made the big trade with Miami. Right. The 49ers are going to take a quarterback at three. 99% mm -hmm. sure. Yep. I'm, I, I, know, yeah, I don't know if you're here in the same room as I am, but I think the 49ers take Mac Jones at three. And, you know, that's tough. I – I personally don't know if, if, if that's the guy for San Francisco. I mean, John Lynch, 
Does he go Mac Jones or does he go Justin Fields? I it, it's you, why, why do you like Mac Jones there? Uh, no, I'm more of a Justin Fields guy, but if you look at it from San Francisco standpoint, Mac Jones can probably can probably win in the NFL right now because if you look at it with San Francisco's offense, offensive line, assuming they stayed healthy, George Kittle, Debo Samuel, Brian Ayu, with Raheem Moser as tailback, Mac Jones can just basically be a facilitator like he was at Alabama. I don't, Mac Jones. Mac Jones is not. Mac Jones is more Kirk Cousins than anything. I think he's. Right. I mean, I've heard some. I've heard people say he's basically a full man's Joe Burrow. I don't. I, he's not Joe Burrow. I don't think he's yeah. that. He's not Joe Burrow. I think he's Kirk Cousins. Yeah. I think. That's, and yeah, Kirk. Think- and yeah, Kirk. Kirk on his day can be really good if you put him with all kinds of capable weapons like he's got in Minnesota with Dalvin Cook, Adam Thielen, uh, Justin Jefferson. But can he, But is he great in the big moments? And from San Francisco, by taking Mac Jones, here, here's what the Niners could do. If Jimmy Garoppolo is playing well, or they got a ridiculous offer from a team, whether it be before or after the draft, training camp, or maybe at the trade deadline, you could the Niners could recruit some or all the draft picks they gave to Miami. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, I, it, and it, I don't think and I don't think Kyle Shanahan wants to babysit Justin Fields. Right. Yeah. I mean, when you put it that way, it's definitely a, a logical solution. It's just the the only thing. I mean, the only thing you think about that is just you know Mac Jones has kind of exploded up the charts lately, and and. Are they are they confident in in him being a number three overall in the NFL draft kind of guy? I mean, obviously they traded up to three, so they're trading up to three with the intention of grabbing their quarterback. Are they would they have I mean, my only thinking is that a lot of a lot of people seem a lot higher on Justin Fields than they do Mac Jones. Would are they thinking going Mac Jones? Are they, are, are they thinking we need to go up to three to make sure that we get Mac Jones? Or would, could you, would there have been a possibility that they could have gotten, gotten a, a little lower up the draft to, to possibly get him? Uh, maybe, maybe the 49ers are playing possum. Like, we like Mac Jones, but, we take, but we'll take Justin Fields to Trey Lance anyway. Maybe John Lynch and Kyle Shannon are playing possum with everybody, right? Yeah. I mean, we never know. Those those draft rooms, those war rooms are as sealed as a uh, as a declaration of independence, I feel like. All right, so let's say let's say Mac Jones is the pick at three, and then we move on to four Atlanta, and that's where things get interesting. Ooh, yes. Yes. I'm glad you asked me about Hot Atlanta because uh, things could get really spicy if it's Lawrence, Wilson, and Mac Jones, the question is, do the Falcons take Trey Lance, Kyle Pitts, or potentially trade back? I personally think the Falcons should take Kyle Pitts. He's the best player not named Trevor Lawrence in this draft. Yep. You've got Matt Ryan. And Matt Ryan's ludicrous contract, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, you're not trading him. Yep. You would incur a not, a not a big cap hit, but as a Who's, who was the uh, call guy? Billy Fusilla? Huge hit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, realistically, and Tom Brady just won a Super Bowl, what, 43? How old is Aaron Rodgers? I mean, 37, 38? Got to be around I mean, there. Matt, Matt Ryan, I think Matt Ryan can play another three, four years plus. Yeah, You've got a young offensive minor, Arthur Smith. Let's see. You've got... Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, and Kyle Pitts. How do you stop those guys? Yeah, that's 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 a pretty nice little arsenal. But I think uh, Matt Ryan would probably be pretty happy with one of those guys. Mm, yeah, I imagine. Yeah, who do you double there? I know who I double, but Kyle Pitts. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it depends. Pick your poison. I mean, that it's that's that's. That's definitely an appealing. Uh, it's definitely an appealing thought for the 
for the uh, mines down there in Atlanta because that, that, those three weapons, that, that'd that be uh, pretty difficult to stop, that's for sure. So, I mean, what do you think happens? Do you think the Falcons take Pitts, take Lance, or potentially trade back? Maybe a team like Denver takes a quarterback. I, I think that, honestly, as much as it pains me to say, I think if Pitts – I mean, assuming Pitts is there, which it, it, ev- almost everyone is assuming the first three picks are going to be quarterbacks unless – unless uh, an unexpected trade from three, but I mean, they already traded up to get there. So I doubt they trade out. I doubt they trade out of it, but um, I, I mean, Kyle Pitts seems like it makes sense. Obviously I'm hoping Atlanta goes quarterback, but I mean, it, like you said, Kyle Pitts is the best player in the draft, not named Trevor Lawrence. And, and I think Atlanta would probably be pretty stupid to, uh, to pass on them there. And so uh, at number five, the Cincinnati Bengals, well, uh, I don't think the I don't think the bank I don't think the Bengals have traded have traded back in forever. I don't remember the last time since like if Cincinnati's picking five, they basically pick where they they all they don't move up the ball, they don't move back, they just stay there. I'll tell you so, what, I will be. And so ultimately, the question with Cincinnati is: Would they take Pitts or Chase or one of the two linemen? Because for your sake. I know what I know what you want him to take, and I've got Cincinnati taking a Slater because he's a Big Ten guy, played at Northwestern. Cincinnati's got two good tackles, but the Bengals need an interior lineman, and I think Slater can be Zach Morton or Quentin Nelson. I think he's first, so he could play left tackle if need be, but I think he'd be a 10, 12 year guard from day one. Yeah, you know I. Cincinnati, if I tell you what, if Cincinnati trades out of that five spot, it will be absolutely mind blowing to me because they've got two. I just because if you look at, at who we are assuming will be there at five, they're picking between either the top two, uh, one of the their choice from the top two offensive linemen in the in the draft, or the top wide receiver in the draft who has college chemistry with their starting quarterback. Hmm, so let's see, let's see what your let's see. I don't know if you watch college football, but Joe Burr and Jamal Chase combined for twenty touchdowns in twenty nineteen. Just saying. They were that's a lot these. of touchdowns. Yeah. So and, uh, if you look at Cincinnati's wide receiver and call me yeah, T. Higgins, T. Higgins. Tyler Boyd. Tyler Boyd, but uh but the Bengals could use another wide receiver. Now, realistically, I think the Bengals probably need more alignment because Joe Burrow got – Joe Burrow wrecked his knee and he needs a little bit of help. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I – so, at, unbiasedly, if I'm looking at it from a Cincinnati Bengals uh, standpoint, I, this is all I have to say as as, as – as mouth-watering as that Jamar Chase pick would be for those Bengals fans, just imagining, just watching LSU highlights, I really do think the lineman is the pick here for Cincinnati. Yeah. I mean, it's you've got some talent. You've got some talent on your receiving core already. There's, st- I mean, there's it's a receiver-heavy draft. There's a lot of depth at the receiver position this year. I mean, a lot of st- a lot of round two guys uh, that are would be probably mid round one guys if if it wasn't for how how absolute top heavy the receiver class is um and for the sole fact that i don't know if you saw the cincinnati bengals release their new uniforms the other day chad ochocinco was on there uh <laughs> i'm a fan of him uh he was helping them release those jerseys but um in one of the clips that one of the very last clips of their jersey uh reveal had joe burrow sitting up on a throne with a football and he had his legs crossed. And the leg that was crossed in front of his leg was the one with the big old scar down the middle of it. Up, down Ooh. the middle of it. And I think after watching that clip and seeing Joe Burrow sit, sitting up there with his, with his new uniform and, and that, that scar straight down his knee, that tells me that Cincinnati, it's a sign that they need to protect that man because – you can have a shiny new toy, but if you don't, you can have a shiny new car, but if you don't get insurance on it, you're, it's, it's not going to be there for you in the long run. And so that, I think the Cincinnati Bengals need to get 
Joe Burrow some insurance, and they need to solidify that o- o- offensive line. Because not, not only does getting an offensive lineman help Joe Burrow, but they've got a really solid running back in Joe Mixon down there. And he could have he's, – he's honestly, I think, one of the most talented running backs in the league. It's just with that, they've had a, a dismal offensive line for years. And uh, so that not only would help their passing game, it would help their, help their running game uh, as well. So I think – I do think offensive line – Maybe a little biasly, but really, uh, if I'm actually like really thinking about it with a level head, I think offensive line is the pick. Whether that's Rashawn Slater or Penai Sewell, you know, you, you made a good point towards Slater. I don't think Sewell is a bad pick for them either. There, but uh, either way that they go, I think that's I think that's the position group to be looking at. Here's an interesting scenario: if Joe Burrow hadn't wrecked his, if Joe Burrow had not suffered the injury. I think the Bengals take Jamal Chase because he's probably be he'd probably be ranked higher than Sewell Slater. And you imagine Burrow and Chase. I mean, quarterback, what you've got chemistry right there. Yeah, I mean, and and who knows the Bengals? I mean, what? There's no reason for them to listen to us. I mean, we're just two guys who like football who want to talk about it. But you know, they still could go even with those linemen there. They still could go Jamal Chase. I mean, it's it's definitely. Something that uh, I know Bengals fan, a lot of Bengals fans want, and it's definitely a uh, an appealing pick for sure. But um, whether it's a smart one, you know, that's that's yet to be determined, I guess. But just ask, just ask Baker Mayfield, Tom Brady, and Tom Brady. The both teams drafted linemen, and uh, I don't remember the Packers or Chiefs getting near Tom Brady in the NFC title game in the Super Bowl when uh, Aaron Rodgers and Pat Mahomes were running for their lives. Yeah, you're right. And so now we get to the moment where you will be doing push-ups and probably wondering what next. Because when Commissioner Goodell says the Miami Dolphins are now on the clock, who are you hoping the Dolphins take? Well, if we're following along with our mock that we've kind of got going here, I mean, it's it's a no-brainer. The second the second Cincinnati puts in that puts in that ticket, and you see that 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 card does not say Jamar Chase's name, you write it in and you send it in. I mean, I with with Kyle with Kyle Pitts gone to Atlanta in this situation, and um, Cincinnati draft an alignment. I mean, you're 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 hoping one of those two guys falls, and and with Jamar Chase uh, in this situation still being there. It's an easy call, in my opinion. I mean, I think he's wide receiver one. You know, obviously, Devonta Smith won the Heisman. You've got the Tua connection, the Alabama connection there. So, Devonta Smith – and see, and this leads me to a, a situation to where, let's say, Cincinnati does take Jamar Chase and Kyle Pitts has already gone to Atlanta. Now you're sitting at six. You miss the opportunity for those two guys by trading out of that three spot. Now, are you trading back – are you happy with Devonta Smith at six? I think Devonta Smith could be a possibility for Miami at six for the sole reason. I think that they think he's a good kid. Um, obviously, they have this the same – they might be going along the same thinking of Cincinnati, whereas you, you've already got chemistry with your quarterback. You know, he won the Heisman Trophy. Yeah, he's a little small in size, but, you know, his, his talent and his, his uh, catch radius, I mean, just his, his talent and athleticism is, is – Heisman Trophy winning at, at, at the very least. Um, at that point, my head would tell me that the Dolphins would trade out if Pitts and Chase are gone. But if the Dolphins did stick at six and pick, so, if pick Devonta Smith, I'm happy with that pick, though. I, if Chase and Pitts are gone, I think it's more likely the Dolphins take a lineman than take Devonta Smith. Because if you look at it, what is this draft full of wide receivers? Yeah. And yeah, there are all some quality linemen available. I mean, the Virginia Tech and there are a bunch of day two linemen. But um, I think it, I think if anything, even if Miami really addressed this offensive line last year, you can never have enough quality linemen. And you yeah. might have to get in Panay Sewell. <laughs> I think two is going to, I think two of them like that on Slater, Mr. Slater. I, yeah. I think that. Because with the, uh, I think of two and wondering how Drew Brees, I mean, Drew Brees lasted until he was, what, 41, 42. Why? Because the Saints build a good offensive line around him. He didn't face the kind of, he didn't face kind of pressure other guys do because two are not being the tallest guy. You can't see over the fenders. Right. So he needs a clean pocket. 
Right. The only, I mean, the only, it's, uh, alignment, you know, at six, that's where it gets complicated with, uh, it, if, if Chase and Pitts are gone. Because, I mean, like you said, alignment, you can never have enough linemen getting one in the top six of the draft, top six uh, of the first round of a draft. You know you're getting a good talent there. I, I, I do agree that a lineman is an is a important position. It's definitely a, we need at least one more good guy. But the Dolphins have been signing a couple depth lineman guys over the last week, couple weeks. They got DJ Fluker, another Alabama guy who – Hasn't had the greatest NFL career, but he's probably not going to be starting. Uh, signed a, a guy from a, a center from Baltimore, a schooler. I mean, they've been making a lot of offensive linemen signings. Obviously, we know they, they did sign Will Fuller, so they've addressed the playmaker position. But I don't think Will Fuller is the guy that they planned on adding in this offseason. I think that the guy that they've been planning to add in this offseason is in that draft. And with Devonta Smith sitting there, I, th- I mean, you know, it just it really just depends on on how committed they are towards get, going after a playmaker. Or I mean, they still have that 18th pick. You know, there's there's definitely going to be a couple guys uh, in the, from the receiver group around at 18. Probably not Smith. Probably not uh, Jalen Waddle. I have to assume that those guys will be gone before then. So um, then you're really either saying, do we wait till the, to the first pick in the second round? Do we trade back from 18 and maybe grab a guy late in the first round? Or do we use that 18th pick to get a skill player? That is if we draft lineman at six. So it, it really, like, like you said, that third pick really changes the rest of the draft and the fourth one as well because uh, uh, obviously Dolphins fans are rooting for Atlanta to take a quarterback at that fourth spot to make our uh, decision a little easier. Or X team to take a quarterback. I mean, if the Broncos take, if the Broncos or somebody moves up the board for a quarterback, it'd be it'd be the same thing because then right. Miami could basically choose between either guy. I mean, what you're hoping for is that both Pitts and Chase are on the board because then it's I think Pitts. I'm like, yeah. Well, Chase yeah. is there. Like, see ya, see ya. Yeah. We'll, we'll take you. We're not letting you go to the Detroit. Right. Here's, a, so, here's an interesting scenario. Chase and Pitts are gone. And let me let me let me throw a hypothetical at you. Okay. And Denver said maybe not Denver, but Washington said we'll give you a one this year. We'll give you all one this year, a one and a two next year. What is Washington's one this year? I think 19, 19 of 20. Looking right now, I got a mock up right here. Washington is picking, they were a playoff team, 19. So Washington jumps up, says, Hey, we'll give you our 19th pick. That way you've got back to back picks at the end, tail end of the first round at 18 and 19. We'll also give you a first and a second next year to move up to six. I don't, I don't think, I don't think the dolphins take that because I just don't think, I think that they are looking to get one of these top, top 10 playmakers. I don't think, I think if they're going to trade back, they're not going to trade farther back than 12. Like they already did once. I think I think trading back to twelve in the first place. I mean, I, I'm assuming that they already had that that six pick uh, trade in mind, or maybe even in basic con- conversation when they made made that move to twelve. I, I don't think that they would trade all the way back for nineteen. But you know, that's me saying that. And Chris Greer has made it very clear that he likes uh, uh, bringing in as many extra picks as he can. So. It does sound like a Chris Greer move, especially if the top two guys are gone at, at six, like we're saying they, they might be. You know, it does sound like a Chris Greer move. Obviously, having that 18th and 19th back-to-back pick would be nice. But you're definitely missing out on a lot of talent if you make that decision. Oh, uh, what if scenarios? Yeah, well, what happens if X team takes this guy or Y team takes this guy? I mean... 
And you know, yeah. and you know, there'd be surprise. There'd be what? There'd be one moment next week when Mel Kiper's like, "What the heck happened?" Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you ready for this draft? You ready for this draft to begin? I mean, uh, I, I'm almost. I'm, I'm ready for this draft to begin. Even I know what my team will do. Yeah, I mean, you're on the clock, so you. Uh, I'm sure you're ready. Your your, your team's. Your team can make that announcement uh, any moment now, which I think they practically already did. But I mean, Trevor uh, Lawrence has already given twenty thousand dollars to Jacksonville Charities. Yeah. If he's not a Jaguar this time next Thursday night, I, yeah. uh, I there may be one or two expletives coming from a sterile. I'll tell you what: if Trevor Lawrence isn't a Jaguar this time next week the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars will become the London Jaguars before you can say, before you can say team crumpets, because there's, there's no way Roger Goodell is letting that franchise stay in America. If, if they pass up on Trevor Lawrence in this draft. If that happened, then why would Urban Meyer, then why would Urban Meyer come to Northeast Florida when he could, when he could just be in Benita, right? Playing golf. Yeah. Yeah, you lose Trevor Lawrence, you probably lose Urban Meyer too, because I don't know who had to make that call. I don't know uh, whoever's on on top of the uh, program there, but he uh, he would lose the fans, he would lose the coach, and he would lose his city. If, if Kurt Balke, please, please take Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, uh, I don't think you've got anything to worry about. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could sit back and relax and like I know who would take him. Right. And then I yeah. will pop him. Okay, so I can't believe we're one week away from the draft. It feels like yeah. it feels normal. It feels normal. Right. Right? I'm trying to think of like what would my rock and roll, what would my rock and roll walk up something be in Cleveland? <laughs> it's tough. Uh, I don't know. Might need that. I might need to ask somebody. I'm trying to think. Welcome to the Jungle would be a pretty good one if you're a Jack. Uh, I like the way you're thinking there. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. That's it. So we wish you all the best and uh, we'll chat probably uh, next. I don't know what we're doing next Thursday. Uh, I think we'll get in a. Duffy's and I don't know what we're doing. Maybe a live stream, maybe a Facebook live or something. Right. Something like that. We'll, we'll have to get something together going, I'm sure. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dylan.